So you can actually give it to us on the shout. You know, so early on Saturday morning. Uh, I guess, you know, many of you have been out last night. And uh, so I'll try to speak a little bit more quietly. <laughs> anyway, now, good morning. And I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to my colleagues, Tom Foley and Michele Pachane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I should know it. You know, you've been oh, working with me for so long. <laughs> I should say so. That's my name, Robert Follet. Follet. Follet, yeah. Anyway, let's see. Today, this presentation is not about design. This presentation is going to be about this, the, 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 what happens behind the scenes when you are faced with a large, global, multilingual, multi-script <coughs> What happens in that process from starting off as a very small team to then um, a big campus design company that has new projects? So let's go into it. You know, I'd like to start off and give you a little bit of a background of where we started as Golden Mark. And it was simpler times back in 2007. We were a small team. We were about six or seven people, not about design. This presentation is going to be about this, the, 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 what happens behind the scenes when you are faced with a large, global, multilingual, multi-script <coughs> What happens in that process from starting off as a very small team to then um, a big campus design company that has new projects. So let's go into you know I'd like to start off and give you a little bit of a background of where we started as Golden Mark. And it was simpler times back in 2007. We were a small team. We were about six or seven people. And with six or seven people in a small team like that, you know, you can make decisions on a daily basis. You don't really have to structure and organize it too much. You come up with an idea at eight o'clock in the morning, or maybe that's a little bit too early, say 10 o'clock in the morning, you come up with an idea. And by 12, you can implement the idea because in such a small team structure, communication is absolutely not a problem. In that small team structure, you also have a situation whereby people can work individualistically, but because it is a small team, you always know what's going on in the office. So working is relatively easy, uh, and everyone can work in each, into each other's hands. Communication looks chaotic, but because it's small, it is actually controlled. The small, team, the small team structure also necessitates that you have smaller projects. And at the time, 2007, we by and large did primarily Latin types and a few Greeks and Cyrillics. And um, with the Greeks and the Cyrillics, we would occasionally work with, uh, with consultants, you know, helping us out. Jerry, for example, on the, uh, on the Greeks. And uh, we became fairly proficient at Latin, Greek, and Cyrillic, and doing it very well. So this is about 2007. And then, a year later or so, we get asked to do the first complex uh, writing system for a project working by Metro. And the project was that a single, it was a single weight, Arabic and Latin only, for signage. And this is exciting. I've always wanted to do an Arabic. You know, you do Latin, Greek, and Syrian. And if you work in a corporate environment, you primarily work with sans serifs. And it is so boring. Once you have done 20 years of sans serifs, you do not want to do sans serifs anymore. It's enough. So an Arabic comes along, and it opens up kind of the field of vision, and it's beautiful. So very excited. You start working. We set up the design concept for the typeface with the Latin, and then go into the Arabic, and start working expectedly, you know, very excited, thinking, yes, this is beautiful, this is great. And then we, I did my friend called Professor Ryan Abdullah uh, to help us with the Arabic as our consultant, and he calls me back and says, Bruno, I've known you for a long time, I think you're one of the best 
tag guys around, but if you ever show me shit like that again, <laughs> at which point I realized, yes, I made a basic mistake. We didn't do our homework. The homework then was to actually sit down, do a bit of research, do the background research in Arabic, do some calligraphic exercises, and I'm talking very basic stuff, just to get an understanding of where the forms come from, how the shapes are, how the shapes have evolved, you know, and, and what the modulations are. And eventually, the typeface came about, as you can see here. And throughout the development process, Arabic and Latin were progressing at the same time. So throughout the whole process, one design influenced the other design. So we ended up with a very harmonious bilingual or bi-script uh, type system for this very specific environment, signage. So at, at, at this stage, in this side of the problem, we were, we were very used to a specific type of usage, print and screen. And it was very predictable, I guess, back in 2007, 2008. So you, knew, you know, and you were familiar with the workflow to testing for print, preparing you know, the font score, use in normal you know, Adobe program systems, and also hinting, um, because it makes a lot of so we were kind of used to those processes. We knew how to do that. It was quite straightforward, <coughs> quite limited as well, but quite hard. Mm. Um, yeah, it, exactly. Because the environments you you would be working for would be predictable. It was print, and it was screen, but screen in a very old digital media in a very limited sense. Uh, in that, it would be a known number of resolutions, a known number of operating systems. Uh, that was an idea. So you could actually design for specific environments. You knew what the output would be. Uh, at this time, this was the, the structure of the development uh, process uh, at Altima. And um, uh, there was the client that was clearly the center, the target, the aim, whatever. And uh, the client the comes, comes to us uh, with a problem and we give uh, a, a solution very really uniform. Uh, we want to show you a bit of the behind the scenes during this presentation. They gave me the green light, so I might say to you that they're not exactly under non-disclosure agreement. But uh, <laughs> please, you just stop me. <laughs> OK, uh, it was a, a pretty solid and structured uh, um, process, divided in uh, three uh, specific stages, design, engineering, and meeting, where uh, uh, the developers were uh, task specific. There was the, the product moving through the process. And uh, the, each department was kind of related to the client uh, in uh, its own uh, individuality. <laughs> OK, uh, talking about tools quickly, uh, because it's important to underline uh, how this was structured. We, we at the design stage, we worked uh, in Font Lab. Then uh, from Font Lab, that is uh, working on uh, VFP formats, we are moving to Vault. The engineering was done in Vault constantly for every project. And here you just can to kind of understand what is the, the sheet from the VFP to a final font format. So Vault, then uh, VTT. Three different stages, structure. And it was OK. It worked fine for the size of the company. Yeah. At, the time. at this time, we're still about seven or eight people. You know, so it's still, you have still have an overview of what's going on in the office. And if there's a problem between any one of the two stages, you just talk to each other. It's, not, it's, it's easy. And then comes Ubuntu. Now, Ubuntu was really the first big and complex project for many reasons. For one, Ubuntu came in 13 different styles, um, from like light to extra bold, italics, condensed, monospace, etc., etc. All the 13 font styles would have Latin, Greek, and Cyrillic. I'm going to speak about Latin. It is Latin A and B extended, so already quite a large language coverage. Uh, Cyrillic extended and Greek polytonic. And the core weights, bold and regular, as the italics would also include. Hebrew and Arabic. Of course, the Arabic was only in the upper rights for the cool bits. Now, this is a huge language coverage, and I also like to say that the Hebrew and the Arabic for Ubuntu both have uh, biblical support to it, and the Arabic is extended to support Asian languages. Too. So, a large wave set. 
quite a complex project. Now, further complexity was added that Ubuntu is open source. I don't know whether any of you guys have ever worked with open source. It is great because you get a lot of access to uh, a lot of information. However, you work with about 100,000 clients. Yeah. And that is the problem. Yeah. My experience with open source is that, whilst it is great, no one ever makes decisions. And it can drive you mad. It can drive you mad. So, we came to Ubuntu and uh, we gave them a nice schedule for delivery. Within about five minutes you know, of starting the project, that delivery schedule was shot to pieces. <laughs> and uh, we, we learned in that process that working with open source is that it is continuously an iterative process. Actually, the idea is probably not to have ever a finished product, but just make the product better and better and better and better. Now, if you work in type on 13 different styles with X number of languages, that is not necessarily the best thing you want to have if you want to keep your sanity. But it is what it is. It is a huge, uh, it was a hugely complex project. You know, and it meant we had to open, you know, we had to increase the size of the studio as well. And by that time, we were about 14 people in the office. Eight designers and some other people doing other stuff. Yeah. I mean, the question, I guess, just take a step back for a minute for a second and kind of ask, you know, give it a bit of context. I mean, what, the question now is, what, what's driving this current trend in multi-script uh, types of projects? Obviously, clients need these while well, you need them. Um, and a big part of it is obviously globalization, whether you agree with the concept of globalization or what your thoughts on it are. Um, it's, it's a major factor. So brands are now competing in, in a global context, where before it was very regional. So a brand will have its regional divisions, they communicate in their own way regionally. In the last 10 years, um, this has changed because technology has now made it possible for, exactly. with you know, uh, social media and digital, digital communications, and also type, to create the tools used to create typefaces can now handle these complex systems and these complex projects. Therefore, there's a problem there, and it's a combination of this global problem, but also the tool being there to answer it. And these kind of come together to, kind of think, to create a backdrop of these, these projects, which is kind of seems obvious, but it's quite important to think about. Yeah. And it's, a really, it's a really shift in, 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 in exactly. the brand's communication. Exactly, and I think in, this is exactly why we probably over the last five or six years have seen a proliferation mm -hmm. of, uh, of non-Latin script development because of that globalization, because big corporate brands are moving into those new markets and have to communicate with the same visual language that they do in their home markets. Because people in new markets are being exposed to what happens around the world through social media, as Tom said, and, and, and have developed a new visual, a, a visual aesthetic as well, or, or are demanding the same visual aesthetic that the brands are delivering their home markets. So, which is great for us because we get to do more work. Um, Tom was alluding to the tools as well uh, that were being used. Um, <coughs> if you just want to quickly give a, a brief overview on the history of the tools, you know, we're finding, of course, you know, in the old days, Mac Type 1. <coughs> Mac Type 1 posts with 256 glyphs in a font. You simply couldn't do probably, you simply couldn't do complex writing systems. It was only until about, only about in 1995 when we, uh, Microsoft introduced TrueType Open for the purpose of providing better typography to Arabic and Indic scripts. And really, this is the precursor to OpenType, to what we have now. So uh, I, I guess some of you were, probably weren't even born at the time here. You know? uh, but this is really OpenType. TrueType Open is what OpenType is today. Or it was. However, if you go further back to 1991, we find that actually Apple introduced Quick for GX, which did anything back in 1991 that we do today. Uh, one of the reasons, I guess, that Quick for GX never happened and never took off is that desktop publishing as such had only been in business for about six years at the time. Most people couldn't even handle a normal PowerScript type 1 font and ha how to install it, let alone how do you handle a, uh, a Quick Draw GX font with all the typographic possibilities 
I, I did those, it just, people couldn't manage it. So therefore, this never happened, this whole development. And it took another 10 years for open time to then really start taking place, you know, together between Microsoft and Adobe. Another key factor, again, as I alluded to earlier, is the changing nature of communications and also this broad range of devices and tools that people are using now to communicate globally. And this is, this is interesting because we don't really have any one single or a couple of target usages. We've got many, and they're possibly unknown and endless, and you don't know where it's going to end up, basically, these days. And this is another driving factor because our brands need custom uh, most of fonts because they need things to work for them in their system, which are often very varied and very complex. But that's, that's, a, that's a serious problem for big companies. That's, it can be a very expensive problem if you don't handle it the right way. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, throwing things. <laughs> so we brought in people at that stage. And then Nokia comes along. Now, Nokia came to us about five years ago, I suppose, it was four years ago. And they said, we want a new, we want a new corporate typeface. Uh, we've been working with Nokia Science, you know, by Spiekerman, uh, perfectly, type, perfectly fine typeface, nothing wrong with it. But it was simply not appropriate for the company anymore. The way the company, if Nokia as a business had moved forward, had moved forward it wasn't appropriate anymore. And uh, designers at Nokia found it also very difficult to work with because Nokia Science has a lot of personality. And they found that it, the typeface would take over. And it wasn't kind of like, it just, just wasn't doing the job anymore. Yeah. So, in those like, very environments, you know, in the nature of content changing, for instance, on websites and on blog posts, I mean, to read that Nokia Science, it was kind of designed for very specific, specific parameters, quite condensed, low resolution screens. So it didn't really lend itself to longer reading, longer tracks of text, which was a big driver behind this because the nature of content is changing so much in the media world and how brands communicate. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, Nokia came along and said, well, we want to remember our Finnish roots, you know, create something clean, simple, pure, you know. And uh, the initial scope of the Nokia project was these script systems, eight of them, I believe, and uh, two of which we have never done, you know, primarily the, the, the Thai and, and the Devon Arbery. And um, so I think, well, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I haven't got a clue how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to say yes. So I said yes to the project, went back, and then uh, we started panicking a little bit. Uh, because for these eight, for these eight uh, script systems, we had about 12 to 13 months to do all of that. We then designed 14 people in, in, in all. However, about three months in to the project, uh, Nokia came back to us and said, OK, we want three more script systems. We'll give you a little bit more time. And then, oh, by the way, we want more script systems. <laughs> you can put that all together with about 19. But well, actually, if you include three, we have 20 script systems in the Nokia Pure typeface. And just to give you an idea of the challenges in terms of scheduling, the Chinese which is a GB18030 uh, standard. Uh, as many of you know, this is 27,500 characters. Three mates of the Chinese had to be produced in seven months from scratch. That is pretty tough. <laughs> this whole thing, altogether, took four years, this project. At any one stage, there was always about 10 people working on it. So, what does that mean? Oh yeah, I forget it, I forget it. So we're working on this, we're already challenged, and then comes HP, and says, we want to open a typeface, and it has to be 10 script systems. And who am I to turn away work? I say, yes, of course. We take it on, on top of the other 19 script systems. And here you can see an overview of uh, uh, the, the HP fonts. HP comes in Latin, Greek, Cyrillic, Arabic, Hebrew, Technography, Thai, and CJK. So, how do we respond to this growth? Or how do we respond to this problem? The growth has to get more people in Exactly. So, we doubled in size. Yeah. 
and then we doubled again in size. So the response was lots of work, not enough manpower, put more manpower on. And this created many challenges. I mean, first of all, where do you find many, many pipelines in a hurry? And yeah. It's tricky, right? So it's <laughs> giving an idea of the job. So 2007, as Bruno mentioned, we were seven people. By the end of 2013, we were 52? Yeah, 52 people. And in 2012, we hired 22 people. Most of them. I mean, half of which are designers and probably half of which are yeah. supports. Yeah. IT, you know, and business support. So that will just give you a sense of also. So you've got this complex project, this complex design problem. Then you've got this complex logistics problem. How do you even plan that kind of work along with actually trying to put these projects off? Exactly. Insane. So where do you find the rubbish? Should we say more? The thing about type design is they're hard to come up. Um, and it's a very specialized industry, so type designs are not as common as, say, graphic designers or illustrators. It's, it's, a, it's a niche craft skill. Yeah. And many established, established type designers either work for existing companies or are established freelancers. It's very difficult to, you know, for us to work with freelancers on a project that scales. So we need to hire um, core staff and kind of bring people in that we can develop, but also we can give, give us enough, bring up experience to the table with the skill. Exactly. To oh, be able to I think you can also speak of personal experience here because Tom was one of the, the 22 batch in 2012. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and basically, the, the way it was, Tom arrived on Monday morning, I went to him and said, Here's your desk, here's your computer, and by the way, here is Tamil. Mm -hmm. Start designing. <laughs> Pretty much that. Yeah. So, how did you do, deal with that? Well, the thing, I, I, I use the term graduate and postgraduate particularly in a wider sense, because not just graduates of Reading and KBK, which are more vital for this growth for a period, there's many, many Reading graduates. But the whole notion of a postgraduate um, designer, somebody who can handle complex research, technical research, design research, and uh, start research and put it together and feed it into a final product. And that's the core skill of this. That was the thing that allowed people to come in out of the university, particularly postgraduate. Not always, some were undergraduate, just very talented people. But those research skills are key in this process, in this process of growth, and being able to handle these big projects and do it in a way that you deliver <coughs> typefaces that are functional, well designed, and culturally sensitive, culturally aware. Um, so that's kind of what got me through, really, the research skills. Yeah. Yeah. So, where do you put them? Can you speak? So, when we were seven people, you know, we worked out of a hut like this. Well, actually, not quite, right, but um, uh, uh, not you remember it, you know, it was like that. It? No, basically, we had like a small studio, just about fitting the 14 people in, uh, in an area in London called Loughborough Junction. And uh, I distinctly remember back in 2005, uh, a new Yardie gang moved in. The Yardies, for those of you who don't know what the Yardies are, are it's basically Jamaican mafia. Yeah. They moved in, and there were shootings in broad daylight. You know, so it is, it is a little bit better. <laughs> so enormous growth. So we have to move, and we move to fancy offices. You know, we are now in Brixton still. You know, no more shootings. I can say that. Uh, we're in Brixton, we're opposite Brixton Academy. We are on the ninth floor, second from the top, and we have the best views of London. However, when we moved into the office, we planned the office for a maximum of 35 staff because we thought, come on, there is simply not that much work in this industry to, to support more than 35 people. It's, cheap, it's simply not possible. So that was our sort of like our growth projection. You know, in a very optimistic sense. Uh, yeah, we were proven wrong. And um, so we hired all these people, we've been 52 people. <laughs> oh, the, thing is, the point to make is that the fact people are coming in from very different backgrounds, very different perspectives, very different places of education, points of reference. And it's, yeah, you know, this is a nice little stretch, it's quite open. But the reality is very different. People were still working in their own ways, people were still being very individualistic. So basically, we had the old structure of a smaller company many, many more people. And that creates many challenges, particularly in terms of communication, because 
people were still working in the sporadic way. People were, we had a pool to develop school designers, but we had no structure within that pool. People were picking up projects and just making them happen, but it was chaotic. It was very, very difficult. And that was one of the main problems that we faced when we grew. And that actually is the moment when I joined the company. I'm still blaming my friends that <laughs> encouraged me to apply for this position. But uh, it was like, uh, it's just insane. But I can tell this after two years and then something, two years and a half, it was madness, pure madness. People working like 24 seven, constantly at the office, nights. It was a camping site. It was like a really um, too much, too much. And uh, we didn't have time. Uh, we need to op optimize the workflow in order to avoid that the clients will come back to us asking for bug fixing and whatever. Um, the, the structure of the workflow was still uh, quite defined in the three main stages, design, engineering, and thinking. Uh, what was introduced was the QA filter, quality assurance filter. We wanted to stop uh, the beast before they going to be released. We want to anticipate any kind of problems. This said, uh, it seems to be um, quite a trivial uh, idea. But in a, in the, at this scale, with a 45 persons working on a different project, is quite relevant. If, even if, well, in a, if you don't have time, you need to anticipate the problems. Uh, I was actually extended to work in the QA team. I was QA and everything, like constant, like uh, they can keep keep coming. And this uh, led, and also we have basically four stages of uh, of QA, and. Uh, yeah, the release was all the, the last step uh, to... Exactly. And I think, I think QA at that stage had become absolutely vital in the process because if you go back you know, to 2007, you're dealing with reasonably small and, and, and with project, with small project, with projects that you have oversight of. Yeah. And the target is quite predictable. So you can get away with doing self-assessment QA. However, the moment you start working with the likes of HP or Nokia or, or Intel or something, where you have corporate entities with very complex projects, with very complex requirements, you cannot afford releasing a product that has a bug. You have to imagine that font is going to be installed on 100 to 200,000 computers. It's going to be embedded into devices. Now, if you have a bug in there, replacing this whole thing not only costs us money to the bug fix, but it costs the, com the client a huge amount of money to go through the entire logistics of replacing this for a farm. You cannot afford making mistakes. Yes, this new structure led, uh, led us uh, to, to actually serious problems. We said a communication problem, and still kind of a uh, Sorry. It's kind of frustrating in a way, but I, I, I come from a, a freelance uh, background. I was kind of the kid of the countryside when I was in Italy. I was working alone, working a lot, freelancing and teaching around. Uh, but still, uh, when you are alone, you work uh, with your own pace, with your own tools, with your own workflow. You, are, you handle everything. You are responsible with everything. And that's actually a quite important shift when we think about the company, where we have 40 people that need to work together. So also naming the folders becomes an issue. Uh, you can get lost. And then uh, we need this uh, kind of structure at this point uh, to achieve a better function. At this stage, I mean, at this stage the, the fonts are still moving in the production line. Still, yeah. you know, the product is moving along the production line. We have the designers, we have engineers. We still have still lots of but at least we have filters in there to catch problems that are in between stages of development. Yeah. Um, so you know, through this period of a really uh, rapid growth, um, we learned a lot, but we had a lot to learn, a lot to reflect upon. So we took a step back. So at this moment, exactly at this moment in time, the company was overheating. There were serious problems in this I mean, it became unmanageable. You have 50 people, everyone's doing their own thing. No one is talking to each other anymore because everyone is so entrenched in their own work. And because of the structure, of the non-structure of the company, no one's talking. It's a problem. 
So as a management team, we took a conscious decision not to take on any new work for three months, which for me as a business owner, that scares the hell out of me. <laughs> because you have wages to pay, you know. Basically, you're just desperate for money to come in. However, we shouldn't have to worry about it because we have all these big projects going on. So we have the opportunity to step back, no more work, no more fresh work coming in for three months, and that actually allowed us to restructure the company. It allowed us to look at ourselves and say, okay, what are we doing? What are we doing wrong? What are we doing right? The first thing we implemented in that structured way was a training program. Um, with the intention to kind of, for, for new, new recruits coming in, to, to bring them up to speed, I guess, with the way we're working, how we're working, the structure that we're developing, but also to afford people that are new in the company to, re to cycle back into, into, into a training period where they could work on skills that they felt they were lacking or they could refine certain skills or learn new skills. Um, I think, okay, this is one of the first one. Yeah, that was one of the, the first attempt in 2013 with the new. And employees to learn yeah. three of them in training, and uh, uh, it's something that we are still uh, fine tuning. But there's a, it was a, I think it's a good introduction in, uh, in the company because, uh, as we said, uh, when you are working alone, and uh, as Tom said, when you are on a postgraduate experience, you are very independent and you manage yourself very well. But in a company, we need to talk the same language, we need to have the same structures in a way. So, Training uh, is a way to assess weaknesses and strengths of people, to work with them, and to bring everybody on the same page so that we can talk the same uh, the same language. Yeah. Um, the training uh, mirrors what is the um, the workflow. So we will have uh, design, we will have engineering uh, training, and we will have we will have uh, hinting training. Uh, why this? We, we don't want the super fun developers. I mean, that's the uh, ideal situation. But uh, we want uh, uh, to expose people to different things in order that they are aware of what, right, what the are consequences of their actions at the first stages. So a designer needs to be to understand what are the implications of uh, his outlines when uh, these outlines will be converted in true type and then needed by someone else. Okay. So this would exactly, and this is this process of learning is quite important. It's not only the implications of the designer creating outlines for the hint, but it is the understanding that the outlines, the digitization, has to be efficient. Because again, if you're working on, on complex projects for big corporates like Inter, data size all of a sudden becomes an issue. If you have a complex character, say uh, in the audio, so which potentially can have a lot of nodes, you need to be able to reduce that to absolute bare minimum without compromising the design integrity. Yeah. As a designer, you need to be aware of that, what the end product is. You, know, you don't necessarily need to be able to make the end product, but you need to have that awareness of the client's needs. Okay, let's let us on to then think about the whole notion of the workflow that we have, which is quite a production line, quite separated. Um, so you have a designer, design, the engineer, engineering, and so on. And each person was in a different headspace, I guess, because they were doing a different specific task, and that was asked, but asked of them, that was the structure that they were working within. And it worked for a while, but as we said, it's not, it doesn't really give you that kind of overview. So the training, the intention of the, the, intention of the training in an ideal world is to create this font developer. Somebody who understands at least understands all the processes and the steps and what's required, and has enough of an understanding that they can foresee problems and plan around them, respond to problems they can do. And in an ideal world, someone who actually, can actually do it all. And we have, you know, occasionally you come across somebody who has the your brain capacity to do everything. It is quite rare, but it does happen. Um, so this, this is the intention of the training. This is kind of where we're kind of going now. We're kind of we're quite brave and pushing people towards this font of the world. It's quite demanding of people, too. And um, they have to, it's quite intense, you get it's a lot of responsibility. And, that, and I, think it's, I think it's also important to mention at this point, you know, the training is not here to stifle creativity. On the contrary, we want to ena enable our designers, our phone developers, to be creative based on the processes that they have learned. So they don't have to worry about the processes anymore because they have inherited, so they can focus on the creativity. It makes you more dexterous as a designer too, you're more you're quicker at it. 
conceptualizing and rocking the issue between the one and the speed of the process. Just to recap then. Yeah, this yeah. basically uh, led us to define uh, what is the actual uh, uh, workflow <coughs> in the company. So we started with the production line situation where everything is very structured. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. It was like uh, here. <laughs> okay, then we move to the EQA filter, and actually it was quite functional. It wasn't integrating in a picture of the work or of the structure. And from this, we are kind of starting to draw the master of the, of the internal work. Uh, we said we don't have uh, designers, engineers, inters anymore. We have uh, phone developers. And we have uh, a, a key figure in the, in the process, that is the project team, that is a phone developer itself, that is un understands the problematics behind design, engineering, and gifting, and he is in direct contact with the client. So he can understand the client because he talks with him. And he can understand what are the issues along the, the workflow. And uh, we introduce these, well, we are in a lot, so we introduce something like uh, this layer of support, and supporting means it could be IT, I mean, we want the machines that work fine, we want people just to be functional and efficient, and it means, for example, skills and process, that is the thing where I'm actually working right now, that means uh, dealing with all the problems that are related to the, to the production of a, of a time phase. It means to talk with everybody. It's like a, sometimes an emergency team, I, the time comes, and sometimes we act directly on the final ones because uh, it's the easiest way to do it. It means uh, giving support to people, it means uh, start to define uh, standards and uh, what we, we call the, the requirements, documentation that people can refer to. I think, but also, I think one of the, ma the major shifts here at this stage is that we introduce teams. So you have to imagine there's a pool of you know X number of designers, 30 designers. At this moment, until here, still very working very individualistically. But we then introduced the idea of teams and created small design units, if you want. And each design unit or each team then gets a project of which in which they nominate the project lead who then deals with the client. And by introducing the team, the, those teams, those project teams, design teams, we actually create mini local maps. So within the design teams, they can have that free-flowing and very interactive setup. Mm -hmm. But it also means that if you have a project like the Moby uh, script project for Nokia, where you have some teams working on the Nokia but on separate parts of the project, the teams then amongst themselves can coordinate with one another to make sure that, for example, aesthetics are maintained across the various script systems, to make sure that everyone is working to the same technical standards and so on and so forth. So we're retaining a certain amount of agility within the company, even though we are relatively large. So as a way also to uh, regain what you talked about, a collaborative environment that was uh, uh, typical of the <laughs> first age of a document mind. And, um, and the, to reduce the communication problem. That is actually something, it's a quite real issue. You, you might spend four days before replying to the client. This happened, this, uh, and uh, I mean, we, we need to admit that. It, this happened, but we don't want that it happens anymore. So these structures somehow foresee these problems and uh, allows us to work better with the client. Uh, we in this this is the final the final uh, diagram as Michael was saying two days ago. This is ago. world domination. Yeah, <laughs> Michael was saying uh, with diagrams uh, everything makes more sense. And yeah, it's <laughs> kind of true. Uh, um, we introduced the this. Uh, we mentioned earlier training yeah, developers yeah. just to see what our system relations. I guess as a, a project or production uh, process. You can see the, the proximity to basically the, the main uh, front development process. So uh, this layer, the training and development, where people we just pull out people from the from the work workflow and allows them to invest their time in a different way to anticipate the problems of the future. 
because uh, there will be problems. Exactly. And, and this is a very important process to pull people out of the normal day-to-day -day production because it gives people an opportunity to reflect on what they have been doing in the past, to gain new skills, and as Michele said, to anticipate potential future problems as well, which they can, the, the insight of which they can bring back into the company, bring back into the teams. Yeah. But then things became normal, in the sense that when Nokia and HP kind of wound down, we were at a stage where actually we were, we had an appropriate amount of work on the books with other people that we had. But we were so used to working intensively, we were so used to working on these really ambitious, complex projects, that we had this group of really committed developers who were super ambitious, super motivated, um, super skilled. And you don't, want to, you don't want them to get bored, you don't want to lose them. So what do you do with people when you're not as busy as you were? What do you do? How do you keep them interested? And what we, what we come up with is that we actively have, have regular internal workshops and various script systems. This is a, so like the Arabic workshop as a um, last year sometime. Um, and you know, this is a design end workshop where people get to do basic calligraphic exercises and then are tasked with you know, creating a, a, a matching Arabic logo for an existing Latin um, logo. It kind of has a link, you know, in the sense that it has a link to the, the real life of the game. The training is set up to, <laughs> the training is somehow set up to reflect what happens in reality. Here we can drive a workshop again, a uh, calligraphic exercise, and then concepts for display, uh, display characters. Um, and can match with this is water, this is not alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> and then we regularly go outside the office and do other kinds of workshops. Here's a slide from a sign painting workshop. This is another internal Greek design workshop which then we ran. Um, Tibetan calligraphy workshop a couple years ago. I mean, we also do a lot of, we sent people out to gain more technical coding skills. And one thing we've engaged with is uh, the Python workshops. We sent them to eight or six, seven, eight, six, seven, to do an intensive week long Python workshop course. Um, and then, I guess, the real, where, where all the stuff ends up, we try and kind of um, utilize these skills and, and these, uh, these experiences to develop our font library. And, and it's, sorry, so that's kind of getting bled out by the, the, um, by the projector. But um, the whole point is to try and develop a font library that we kind of we use this kind of experience and this knowledge to try and you know, offer better services to our customers as well. In that sense. So we have active hay. Um, this is a work in progress, sorry, as I grabbed the slide yesterday. This is um, F for Arabic, and then the bottom you can see Blend Thai. But you know, this is the idea that you want to use this experience and, and, and utilize it and develop it. And sorry, just one, yeah. second, one thing it, it, it's worth to mention uh, with the library project, we also um, try new approaches to development of a, of a typeface. We, we said that we're using mainly we're using we're still using font lava, bold, and PPG for binding, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that that is our just main like the only focus of our company. Is that we we elaborate library project even if we have uh, deadlines also for we treat this as a real project. We have the opportunity to test new processes, new applications. That's why I'm starting with uh, Georg. I think. <laughs> I think that you, Bruno, and Georg, you had like a, a conversation about glyphs. It's like glyphs and Dalton Magnus, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, the evil. <laughs> but no, that's a, it's just, a, just, just joking. But it, it's a way for us to understand what's going on out there. We don't want to be, uh, we take care of the general process, the mindset of the fund developers, but we need to be up to date with all the tools that are available outside. So. If library project can be developed in font in raw font and with the FDK instead of font up and reward and things like this. Now all these all these changes over the last few years have also led to a more radical change in, in the way we think about our library projects, or our library fonts in terms of sales. One of the biggest things we've done is to what used to be different language editions or different script editions in our fonts, which were so separately, actually bring them all together into a single single edition. I have never understood why on earth someone who uses Arabic natively, why they have to pay more for the font than someone who uses Latin. I never understood that. 
In my opinion, that's plain discrimination. So basically, not only do you have to look a more complex writing system than the guys in England, on top of that, you will have to pay more for the fonts to write in your native language. That's plain wrong. It's plain wrong. Yeah. So, whenever we have new script systems going into a font, it becomes a single edition at a single price. The price does not go up, it stays the same. For a single user license, £15. Now, Active Protest currently has Latin, Greek, Cyrillic, Arabic, and Hebrew. And in the future, in the soon future, it will also include the Dagari. And it will stay £15 for a single user license. That is to support communities outside Europe, outside the Latin speaking world, who have complex writing systems. I do not understand why they have to pay more. I don't understand that. So this was a big shift for us you know, to do that. What were we going to talk about? I mean, trial licenses. <laughs> Fully functional trial licenses. Fully functional trial licenses. This is also what we've realized with the restructuring. We started to realize that with the globalization and the increasing use of mobile, and so mobile media and social media, people have different demands to us as phone designers. And one of the things is that people today want to test fonts before they buy it. They want to have a fully functional product. They want to stick it onto their computer, and they want to see if it actually meets their needs. Don't want, we have all of our fonts as free trials. And you may say, how can you do that? How do you protect? You know, how do you know if people steal your fonts or not? I don't. I don't. But I trust my customers to do the right thing. And I trust them because myself, the guys from Monotype, the guys from Lionotype, Font Smith, Font Bureau, for the last 20 years have been banging on in the design industry and with our user and customer groups. We have been banging on about the need to purchase the correct licenses. And that banging on, that educational process about licensing is now starting to pay off because we can trust our customers to give them free licenses. And I know that they will buy the proper commercial license once a project goes live. I know that for a fact. I'm trying to think about when a part of the possible part of the service. So, um, you know, yeah. and the fighting is about that. So you want exactly. to have some the... Exactly. And the main thing is people yeah. want to do the right thing. You, and, and it's been proven many times over in other industries yeah. as well. People want to do the right thing. You simply have to enable them to do the right thing. So as part of the whole reorganization process, we also reorganize our licensing. For example, web licenses, we only do flat, re flat rates. We don't do page views. I don't understand you know, why I want to give the burden to a corporate client with X hundred thousand users, why I want to give them the burden of how we do page counting. I don't understand that. Flat rate. Per per the name. Per the name. So this brings us now to a point where we have a company through the huge amount of through the huge amount of growing pain that we have. And things went horrendously wrong in that growing pain during that growing period. We are now a company of nearly 50 people, and we're producing big multi-script corporate projects in an organized fashion. But with the structures that we have introduced, and that Michele and Tom have so beautifully explained to you, with the structures, we are actually as agile and as responsive as the company we were back in 2007. It's not chaotic anymore. We can respond immediately. We are a customer-led company that can respond to the changes. And trust me, the changes are happening fast, you know, faster than we would like. You know, and we need to wake up to that. We need to wake up to how people use fonts and how people use global fonts as well. And I think that's it. Thank you.